We're returning again, John chapter 6, and I want us to always remember John's purpose in writing his gospel. We've repeated it many times, which is that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Jesus, we may have life in his name. So, in the purposes of the various gospel writers, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you're familiar with the New Testament. Um, not all of the gospel writers with the empowerment and prompting of the Holy Spirit include everything in their gospel. They each have a certain focus. So it's interesting to note that in this account that we're reading today, Luke, the gospel of Luke, doesn't even record it. He did not put it in his gospel account. And it's also interesting to note that Matthew is the only gospel writer who included Jesus getting out of the boat and briefly standing on the water before he began to sink. Okay, but Matthew writes about it. Luke doesn't write about anything. Matthew includes P Peter in his account. Okay, and then um, John and Mark um, re record it, but they don't include uh, Peter. Now, it's interesting also that Mark's uh, account ends with, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And if you notice in John, last week we had the feeding of the 5,000, and then we cut to the scene of Jesus walking on the water, and then we'll read about Jesus' explanation of the account of feeding of the 5,000 and he being the bread of life. So Mark includes these, those words, and John's account ends with these words, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So each of these three Gospels are recording the same event, and all three versions are accurate while emphasizing different things, and they all point to and reveal the true identity of Jesus. Now, John continues to give evidence of the true identity of Jesus while painting a picture of people's response to Jesus. In the account of the healing of the disabled man at the pool at Bethesda, we just read that a couple weeks ago, we read that the religious leaders want to kill Jesus, and Jesus responds by resisting them. That is in John 5. In the account of the feeding of the 5,000, we read that the crowd wants to use Jesus, and Jesus walks away from them. Now, in our account this morning, we read that the disciples obey Jesus, and Jesus then walks away towards them. So John is tying each of these accounts together, not just revealing Jesus's identity, which is his main point, with the desired result being that we, the readers, the hearers, would believe in Jesus. Not everyone did, so he's pointing that religious leaders opposed him. Jesus responded by resisting. The crowds went to him to use them for their own selfish desires, and Jesus slips away to pray. And then connected next is this story this, that we're looking at this morning, where Jesus then goes to those who obey him. One of the things that struck me in the passage we're looking at today is how Jesus initiates and interacts with his disciples. And from this short account, we will see how Jesus initiates and also interacts with us. Now, in John's account of the event of Jesus walking on the water, we'll see the following distinctives of Jesus. That following Jesus is not always 
easy. Sometimes we make slow, painful progress. We see Jesus demonstrate his identity by fulfilling Old Testament scriptures, which should shape and strengthen and solidify our faith in Christ. And we'll see this morning that Jesus' deliverance is not about getting us out of the storm, but it's about getting him into the boat. That's where we're going this morning, and I break it down into three points, with all of them pointing to us, our response of trusting in Jesus, perhaps for the first time, perhaps again and again, deepening and strengthening and broadening our foundation of trusting in Christ. So I'm going to read this whole thing in one shot, and then we're going to return back and look at a few elements of this account. So again, this is John chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 16, and I am reading this morning from the ESV version. So this is what it says. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. This is right off there again, after the feeding of the 5,000, it was getting dark, and they went down to the sea by Jesus' request and command. They got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles against the wind in the darkness, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were terrified, frightened. But Jesus said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. That is the whole record in John's gospel. No explanation. But what is God telling us in this? What is the Holy Spirit revealing to us about Jesus? And how are we to respond to this account? Here are my suggestions. Number one, trust in Jesus who sends us. Trust in Jesus who sends us. Now, again, the disciples were following the instruction of Jesus as Jesus went up the mountain to pray. If you remember from last week, or you can just scroll up and look at the text right before this account. He sent the disciples across the sea in a boat. Now, I imagine it had already been a very long day. There was thousands, tens of thousands of people coming up to them. They were there. It was hot more than likely. And they were working food service that day, right? Serving and serving and serving and collecting and collecting and collecting and organizing and organizing and organizing. It had been a really long but powerful and exhausting day. And they trusted Jesus. And they did what Jesus asked them to do. Even though it would be getting dark soon, they got into the boat and started rowing. Remember, Jesus told them to do this. And Jesus, being the creator of the world, knew what he was sending them into. And so these men got in a boat and they started to row. And as they continued to row, it got darker and darker and the wind really started blowing. 
really forcefully against the direction that they were intending to go. Now, it's hard enough to row a boat. If you've ever rowed a boat, that's not easy work, right? Even on a good day, even when the sun is shining, but it was dark, they were going, the wind was blowing, and they were straining to go in the direction that Jesus asked them to go. Now I imagine their backs were aching. And the other gospels say it was about three or four in the morning when Jesus showed up. So they've been at it for some time from when the sun went down. Okay, we'll be generous and say it was 9 p.m. till around three or four. So six hours of continual rowing in the same direction because this man Jesus told them to go. And Jesus wasn't there helping them row either, right? aching back, I bet blistered hands, right? aching knees, but on and on they go in their painful plotting of, of following Jesus. Following in the direction of Jesus does not, does not always mean that plans or the pathway, pathway will result in pain-free progress. Do you hear me? Okay. When you and I follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that it's all flowers and daisies and ice cream sundaes with cherries on top, right? Now, it'd be great, right? And we know that there are rewards. We know that there's blessings along the way. But it doesn't mean that everything Christ asks us to do is easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's even excruciating. Sometimes the progress we make will take time, be painful, and require consistent work and continual exertion. This does not mean that you are not in the will of God. Do you hear me? Okay. On the contrary, this may mean that you are in the heart of the will of God. Sometimes Jesus sends us to do things that are difficult, things that require effort, things that temporarily may cause pain. Sometimes following the word of Jesus does not get progressively easier. Sometimes it gets progressively harder, just like these obedient, faithful, faith-filled disciples of Jesus. The farther they went, the harder it got, not the easier. But they kept up. My encouragement to you, if you are finding yourself at this point in the story, keep rowing. Keep trusting that Jesus has a plan. And his plan ultimately... Is for his purpose, which ultimately will be in our best interest. Process, progress, perseverance is important to God. It builds us, it strengthens us, it shapes us. And it's for a purpose. In the end, it will always be worth it. Keep rowing. Keep trusting. So I have to ask you, do you trust Jesus? Are you trusting Jesus? The one who 
sends you out into, at times, strong oppositions and sometimes difficult circumstances. Do you trust him when he calls you and sends you? Jesus has always been in the sending business. Jesus himself abandoned the safety and the comfort and the glory of heaven and came to us. Right? He came himself and he would never ask you to do something that he has not already done, nor will he go, he, also he will go with you. Do you trust him? And if you find yourself in something difficult, remind yourself of following Christ and the will of God. Do you trust Jesus' word and commit to continue to follow? Even though it may be difficult, even though it may cause you pain, These disciples, if they were not doing what he told them to do in the conditions that were difficult, these guys in that boat obeying Jesus, they would not have seen another facet of who Jesus is. They saw something that the crowds didn't see. No one else saw this. The crowds were more than likely sleeping. It was dark. It was windy. No one was around. They were in the middle of the lake. But they saw something that no one else would have. And those who follow, trusting in God's word, will see things that others will not. Do you hear me? In slow, painful progress, God has a plan. And the Jesus who sends us, watch what happens next, is the Jesus who finds us. Continue. If you are rowing against the storm, continue. Continue. To trust in his word. Because the one who sends is the one who will find you. That is my next point for you and I to consider. Trust in Jesus who indeed finds us. Trust in Jesus who finds us. Which is the next slide. Hit the next slide. Thank you. Jesus walks away from those who want to use him. But Jesus walks away towards those who follow his word. Did anybody just catch what I said? This is a comparison to the the other story. This is why um, John records the responses of the crowd. And we have to ask ourselves, what is our response to Jesus? If your plan is just to use Christ for your own self-centered purposes, good luck. Right? He is the great king. He is not beholden to your demands of him. Do you understand? Right? He has a plan. He's not trying out to be king and trying to appease the crowds. He already is the king. We have opportunity, we have an invitation to preach, to approach him, right? and we should take that, but he is surely the sovereign king, and you're not. Right? Don't get that mixed up, because sometimes people do. 
Now, Jesus who sends us is also Jesus who finds us. When they had rowed, this is John 6, 19, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. Now again, the disciples were working hard to follow the directive of Jesus. And Jesus came out to them. The good news is that Jesus does not lose sight of anyone. No one is inside, outside of his reach. If you think that Christ has forgotten you, or he doesn't know where you are, or he cannot reach to you or to those you love, he can reach anyone, anywhere, at any time. Regardless if you are in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a sea where no one knows you, with no lights on, with no cell phones, with no anything, right? Right? Amazing to think how he would even find these folks because I have been out on the ocean and all there is water and if it's dark and you can't see anything, it's hard to know any place and what's going on. Guess who knows and who sees in the darkness? Jesus does. And he can reach because no one is outside his reach. So I have to think about this. So Jesus waited all this time. Right? He could have come to them when they were like, you know, 100 yards from shore. Like, hey guys, wait for me. Could have done that. Jesus intentionally, you're not going to like this word, waited He waited for the right time. Because he was developing his disciples. And he was going to show them, because they intentionally persevered in following his word, something about his character that they would never seen otherwise. So he waited all this time. When the conditions were right to come and find them, and he does the same for you and I. Again, perhaps you are right now rowing your boat merrily down the stream. Row, row. You guys remember that one? Or unhappily upstream against the wind and the waves, and you are tired. Perhaps you are rowing your boat following the words of Jesus and thinking that it shouldn't take this long. When is this going to be over? When am I we're going to arrive to the destination? And perhaps you're feeling that you're making slow, pitiful, painful progress. That the winds and the seas and everyone is out and it's rough. And at just the right time. Jesus comes to us. So why? Why did he wait so long? Why does he allow us to struggle? Why is it so hard sometimes to follow the will of Jesus? You want to know why? Because you will learn things about Jesus in the rough waters that you'll never learn in the green pastures. He's in both places. And you will learn something different in each of these places. Do you trust Him? When the waters are rough, when the wind is blowing, when you can't see a thing, it's dark and you're in pain, but you are hanging on to the directives of Christ, will you trust Him? Because if you do, you will see something that you will not see any other way. Trust in Jesus. Do what he tells you. Trust in him that he will come to find you. 
Hold on, keep going. He's not left you or abandoned you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't lost track of you. Continue to trust that the God who sent you is the God who will find you. Hear me. This is Christ. And check out what happens next. This is my third point for us to consider. Trust in Jesus who comforts us. Verse 19, second half. Here's Jesus walking on the water. They see him and they were frightened. But Jesus said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately again the boat was, in the, was at the land to which they were going. Now if you were in that boat, you would be frightened as well. Now there's plenty, if you've ever been on the ocean, I've been on the ocean quite a bit actually, there's plenty of scary things in the water. Scary, scary, scary things. But it's a whole nother level of scared when you see something not coming through the water but on top of the water. The other gospels say they were terrified, as in frantic. Could you imagine that? What is that? They were frightening, frightened. You notice who calls out first? Mm-hmm. Remember this initiating Jesus, sending them, finding them. Jesus calls out to them in their fear, and the same is true of us at times. Jesus knew. That they were scared. And after walking three to four miles on the ways of the sea, Jesus spoke to them, saying, It is I, do not be afraid. That's at least how most of our English Bibles translate the phrase. But literally, Jesus said, I am. Ego of me, do not be afraid. He used this phrase that these scared Jewish boys immediately understood. I am. And because I am, you do not have to be afraid. God spoke this very phrase from the burning bush to Moses when Moses asked, Who are you? And God says, I am who I am. This is the same phrase that God proclaimed to Isaiah when he said, I am the Lord. And beside me there is no Savior. So Jesus, to these boys in these rough waters, said, I am, right after he demonstrated who he was by doing only what God alone could do. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you'll know of a guy named Job. There's a long book in the Old Testament telling his story. And Job, in the midst of his pain and his heartache and his loss and his fear, talked about the characteristics of God and said of him, he is the one who removes mountains. He is the one who shakes the earth. He is the one who commands the sun. And he alone stretches out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. 
what Jesus was doing is fulfilling and identifying himself with something God could only do, and that is what? Trample on the waves of the sea. When Jesus walked on the waves, and this wasn't even walking on flat water, that would have been a miracle enough. But walking on flat water is not what was prophesied about God's character by Job in the midst of his pain, saying that the God that I serve tramples on the waves of the sea. And here comes Jesus. It's why they needed to get out that far. It's why there needed to be waves so God himself could trample on those waves. The same God who makes footprints in the sand, are you familiar with that? Is the same God who tramples on the sea. He walks in both places. Jesus was doing only what God can do. And Peter tried it for a moment. Right? He only could stand there because he looked at Jesus. But once he took the eyes off of Christ, down he went. God is the only one who can trample on the waves of the sea. John included this story so that you would understand again and again and again the characteristics of this one who is called Jesus. Now doing only what God himself could do. This is not a story about getting people out of storms. This is a story about getting Jesus in the boat. This is not a story about who we are. This is a story about who He is. Do you hear me? Jesus was demonstrating by The works he did, if you remember a few weeks ago, giving witness to his character. This is one of those works. No one else can do this but God alone and look at me go. Hebrews talks about Jesus this way, saying that he is the radiance of the glory of God. The exact imprint of his nature. This is Jesus. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. The one who created it all can do whatever he pleased because he is the Lord of all. This helps us to understand who Jesus is is he is the king of all kings. Do you understand this? He indeed is the suffering savior. He indeed is the merciful healer, but he is ultimately the supreme glory of God, made flesh, expressing the word in the heart of God. He upholds the universe by his word, He is the God who is with us. He is the one who comforts us by his presence. His rod and staff, they comfort us. The greatest comfort God offers us is that he is with us. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you read in Scripture and if you look for all the times in which we're afraid, and by the way, as humans, we're a pretty afraid bunch, right? I don't care how strong you are. It's hardwired in us. We're afraid by nature of the unknown, of the dark, of cats, right? We're afraid. (laughs) Unpredictable creatures. 
and spiders and snakes and your email. I don't know. We get, we get scared of stuff. The number one comfort God gives to people who are scared, which includes you, is I am. I am with you. Remember that in the face of a storm. <laughs> Again, it's not, the point is not getting us out of storms. The point is having Jesus with us in every storm. And when Jesus stepped in that boat, once they knew it was him, they gladly welcomed him in, knowing that with him they are more secure than any dry land. With him in the boat, it's much better because of his companionship, because of his patience, because of his care, because of his power. John quickly ends it saying, and immediately they were to their destination. Now, it doesn't mean that there was like teleportation happening. All of a sudden they're here and boom. What it means is in comparison to the, slaw, the uh, long, painful progress that they were making over six, seven, eight hours of work, in comparison to that, they got there quick. <laughs> the seas died down and they were there quick. Jesus, by the way, in this story, is the ultimate destination. He will be with us in our going. He will send us to do his word, but he will meet us in every place. It's fascinating. Responses that he's giving. So if you continue to read, right, after this story, you just read some Bible, split it up right at this verse, some continue on. But if you read the text, you'll see the next day that the crowds who were there at the feeding of the 5,000, five they wanted some more food. Others heard the news that there was free pizza for everybody, right? Fish pizza. Delicious, right? Just like at a college campus, right? They were coming. <laughs> and then it got in the morning and they realized, wait a second, where's the disciples? Oh, wait, where's Jesus? Right? They're like, ah, I don't be around here for y'all. And then they left and they looked for Jesus, right? Now, the next two weeks are important, right? Pastor Michael is going to be speaking. This is kind of a two-parter next week and the next week following. It's important for you to see how these things loop together and returns back to the feeding of the 5,000 in the midst of feeding, uh, excuse me, this storm. And we'll see coming up that Jesus again proclaims another I am. He is the one who tramples on the water. He's the one who comforts us. He is, does what only God alone does. And he also says coming up that he is, or I am, the bread of life. So the thought is today, as I'm concluding, right, we'll sing a song, we'll hang out. If you want prayer, there's people here to pray with you. I'll be up here to pray with whomever, right? I want you and us to think. Trust in the God who is strong. Are you trusting him today? Well, Dave, you don't know how big my problem is. <laughs> well, apparently you don't know how big your God is. Trust in the Lord who is near. Trust in the Father who cares for you. Trust Jesus who loves you. Did you hear those scriptures that were read for us? Take that 
home. Trust Jesus who will send you, who will find you, and who will comfort you in your fears. And in all these things, have peace. For your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Do you hear me? The gardens you plant, the places you go, the people you pray for, the love you give, the offerings that you invest, the sacrifices you have made, your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Believe it. Trust Christ. Following the Word of God will always be worth it. So God, how marvelous it is for us to have these words in a language we can understand, to have time to consider what is written. God, I ask that we would be people who respond to your words because we love you. Not a crowd that just follows you and demands that you give us more. You are worthy of it all. And with you, we can sing it as well with my soul. Jesus, you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy to be followed. Send us, you follow us, you comfort us, you redeem us, you make us new, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You are God. We trust you and thank you that we can have life in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.